Welcome to our Sunday evening service for March the 7th, 2021. Uh, this is Outline of End Time Events, part number six. And we're going to try to finish up tonight, but I doubt it. If I don't finish tonight, we will continue uh, in our Sunday evening service next uh, Sunday night as we meet at church. We will hopefully be able to do Facebook Live also uh, on the, at Sunday at church if our web if our internet service is okay. So, uh, outline of end time events, uh, part number six. I'm going to wrap this up hopefully tonight. I doubt if we will be able to, but I'm going to try. Events in the first half of the seven year period. I want to go over that one more time. Uh, temple sacrifices instituted, Revelation chapter 11. Hi, Sharon. Hi, Kelly. Uh, the temple is going to be rebuilt. This will be the Antichrist temple. Already plans are complete and ready to go. Uh, for this temple, it can be built in a matter of weeks. This is the third temple. The fourth one will be built during the 1,000-year reign. All seems well for God's people as they await the arrival of their Messiah. Uh, they don't realize he's already come in Jesus Christ, but they didn't recognize him. So that's one of the reasons for the tribulation is so that many Jews can be saved out of Israel. Uh, that's the first thing that's going to happen. Uh, events in the first half of the seven year tribulation the two witnesses will begin their ministry that's number two the two witnesses 11 revelation 11 chapter 3 and i will give power to my two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days the two witnesses begin their ministry uh some they say this could happen in the last half but i believe that it wouldn't make sense for them to be taken up just before christ comes back with his church see they're going to be raptured just before uh going to be raptured and taken to heaven so uh, if they're raptured at the end of the tribulation, they're going to have to make a U-turn, grab their horse, and come back with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that would be a U-turn for them. I believe also they are given warnings, uh, giving warnings about the last half of the tribulation, known as the Great Tribulation. They witness for 42 months. They are killed at the midpoint, according to Revelation 11, 7. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. So they witnessed throughout the tribulation and uh, the first half of the tribulation. Number three, the 144,000 Israelites saved and sealed and become preachers of the gospel, Revelation 7, 1 through 8. Uh, after these things, I saw four angels standing in the four corners of the earth holding the four winds, and they, they sealed. Uh, tomb is given to hurt this earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed were uh, a thousand, or, I'm sorry, were a hundred and forty and four thousand of all tribes of Israel, twelve thousand from each tribe. That's Revelation 7, 1 through 8. They witnessed throughout the tribulation. Uh, tell, this Matthew 25 tells that the judgment of the sheep and the goats at the end of the tribulation is due to the way these witnesses were treated or their message was received. If you received their message, treated them well by accepting Christ, uh, uh, as the king of the Jews, you may enter the millennial kingdom. If you did not, you're cast into hell at the end of the tribulation. You're resurrected, uh, not resurrected yet, but you're cast into hell, waiting your resurrection at the end of the millennial period if you're not a Christian. Okay, that's events at the uh, in the first half of the tribulation. Now, uh, there's going to be silence in heaven. If we're continuing events in the first half, there's going to be silence in heaven for one half hour. Revelation 8, 1, when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about the space of a half an hour. Uh, trumpet judgments begin and are completed in the first half of the tribulation. I don't know if I made this clear last week or not. I think I might have said the trumpets come in the second half, but uh, I reviewed my notes and uh, I think I might have confused even myself on that, but uh, I believe the uh, events in the book of Revelation are in chronological order, so if that's the case, that means the seals, uh, of course, are down through history, as we learned a couple of weeks ago in part four. The seals occur throughout, the seal judgments are unleashed throughout world history from the time of Christ up until the tribulation, first half of the tribulation, and then we've got the seal, or the Remember the seal blows a trumpet, eats out of a bowl. So you remember the the seals that 
these entertainers would use. A seal was trained to blow these little horns, these little trumpets. So a seal, you know, the actual animal, the seal, blows a trumpet and eats out of a bowl. So that's how I remember the order of the trump of the judgments in the book of Revelation. Revelation 8 1 tells about silence in heaven for about a half an hour. And then we're going to have the uh, trumpet judgments, which is number five. Uh, trumpet judgments will begin. Silence in heaven is number four. And then we've got uh, the trumpet judgments. Now, some believe the seals and the trumpet judgments appear in the second half of the tribulation due to the pouring out of God's wrath, uh, uh, which is occur, the pouring out of God's wrath occurs with the bold and vile judgments. That's why I believe it comes in the second half. And there's another reason I believe that also. But Israel flees in Revelation 12, 6. Why? Because the Antichrist has declared war on them. Evidently, the abomination of desolation has occurred, and that's in the midpoint of the tribulation. We know that's the midpoint of the tribulation period, according to Daniel. Uh, Revelation chapters 11 and 12 seem to be the midpoint of the tribulation. If the judgments fall consecutively and uh, concurrently in order, we can also conclude that the book of Revelation is in chronological order. Uh, the seven angels stood before God. They were given seven trumpets. Another angel stood at a heavenly altar and had a golden censer. He was given incense. He was to offer, offer the incense with prayer, with the prayers of the saints. You think prayer is not important? There's, uh, that's the second time prayer of the saints are mentioned in the book of Revelation. The seven angels prepare to sound their trumpets. The first angel sounds and it gives hail and fire and one third of the trees and plants are burned up. This is in the first half of the tribulation, according to many. I'm not saying that's the way it, it is, but that's the way I believe, and many others concur with me. Uh, the second angel sounds its trumpet, burning mountain cast into the sea. One third of the sea becomes blood. One third of sea creatures die. One third of ships destroy. The third angel sounds, star, the star wormwood falls into the sea. Water becomes bitter and many will die. The fourth angel sounds, one third of men smitten. One third of the moon, one third of the stars darkened. Day and night were darkened by one third. An angel flies, this is in Revelation chapter 8, uh, I'm talking about. And an angel flies through the midst of the heaven and pronounces three woes about the next three trumpets. In Revelation 9, the fifth angel sounds, this is the first woe. Uh, we've got nine or seven, uh, six trumpet judgments plus one, the last judgment of trumpets announces the bowl judgments. So uh, the fifth angel sounds, this is the first woe. A star falls from heaven, there's trumpet judgments, and then there's three woes. A star, a star falls from heaven, an angel, it is an angel given the key to the bottomless pit. Creatures come from the bottomless pit, smoke comes out of the pit along with locusts. Locusts like scorpions that look like horses and torment people who have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Everybody but the 144,000. They torment the whole earth. For five months, but they are not allowed to hurt the grass or any green thing or tree. The sun is darkened in the air by the smoke from the pit. Locusts live for five months. Uh, it's a fact that locusts live around five months, and it's interesting that uh, these locusts will torment men, uh, torment people on the earth for five months. And men cannot die. People can't die. Locusts have breastplates like iron, gold crowns, hair like women, and teeth like lions. This is uh, the first woe from the fifth trumpet. They have wings, uh, sounds like many horses running to battle, tails that sting men for five months, sounds like drones used in a military to me, which is very possible with today's technology. But they come from the bottomless pit, so it probably is demonic. These locust scorpion-like things with uh, they have uh, breastplates like iron, gold, crowns, hair like women, teeth like lions. Uh, it sounds, it, it, they have tails that sting. Could it be a drone? Could it be some demonic? Probably if it's coming from the pit. Could it be a demonic uh, machinery type thing? I, I think it's more a creature. When the Bible is to be taken literally, take it literally. If it if it makes sick sense to take it as in the literal sense, then seek no other sense. So where is the bottomless pit, though? It doesn't say. 
uh, the bottomless pit must be somewhere in the Middle East because this is where all this action is taking place. Remember, Bible prophecy began in Israel, in the Middle East, and it will end there. And that's where you see all the action today. That's what really matters. I mean, a lot of things going on in America, but we're not in Bible prophecy. So we can only assume that we're not a part of the end time picture because we're not mentioned in Bible prophecy, even though bad things are happening to us. Nothing uh, that can't concur with the evil going on in the world. You know, like evil men wax worse and worse. That would be a worldwide phenomenon, I'm sure. And uh, it is. We're seeing it today. So first half of the tribulation, the judgments are occurring. Uh, you know, these creatures have a king over them. His name is Abaddon, He's, whose Hebrew name is Apollyon, a demon ruler. How horrible this person will be. Now here is another person that comes from the pits of hell. We've got the beast, the antichrist, uh, the false prophet, Satan himself. Now we've got this leader of these locust-like creatures. His name is Abaddon or Apollyon. And uh, this is from the, the fifth trumpet and the, the first woe. No wonder it's a woe. Now, people who say that we're already in the tribulation, I would ask them, where are these creatures? When were the 144,000 sealed? When did the two witnesses preach? Uh, when did the angels uh, blow trumpets? When, were the, uh, when did all this take place if we're already in the tribulation? Uh, when did, well, let's go back. When did... Uh, one-third of ships destroyed, one-third of sea creatures die, one-third of tr trees and grass burned up, one-third of the sea became blood, uh, one-third of men killed with the fourth, fourth trumpet, one-third of the moon and one-third of the stars darkened. When did that happen? Day and night were darkened by one-third. Uh, then an angel flies through the midst of heaven and pronounces three woes and the next three trumpets. When did that happen? If we're already in the tribulation, you got to take the book of Revelation literally unless it makes no sense. Well, Jack, this doesn't make sense, but it is possible and it is Bible prophecy and this is going to be a time like no other time. The Bible says there'll be no other time like this time. Uh, no other day like this day. The Bible talks about, and I preached this morning in Isaiah where it, it three times it said, in that day. This is a day like no other day. This is the day of the Lord that begins with the rapture of the church. So to tell, to tell me that we're already in the tribulation, I would ask you, where are these things at? When did a star fall from heaven? And when did it was an angel given the key to the bottomless pit? When did, when did creatures come out of the bottomless pit and sting men for five months and torment them and they couldn't die? When did that happen? Well, this is all figurative. Well, what was it? If it's figurative, when did one third of the people in the world die? Well, we've had the... Spanish flu, and we've had bubonic plague in the past. But you said it's tribulation now. Just because the man you wanted to elect president didn't get elected doesn't mean we're in the book of we're in the tribulation. Just because America's going through bad times doesn't mean you're in the, we're in the tribulation. Remember, the focus is on Israel and the Middle East. Uh, the sixth trumpet now sounds, and this is the second woe. Four angels are loosed for a year, a month, a day, and an hour to kill one-third of mankind, uh, 200,000 thousand horsemen. And thus I saw the horsemen in the vision, and then that sat on them, having breastplates of fire and of jackson and brimstone, and the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. Revelation 9:17 says, For uh, their power is in their mouth and their tails, for their tails were likened to serpents and had heads, and with them they do hurt. Revelation 9.18. Sounds like some kind of uh, war machine. Uh, this is an incredible uh, army here. Uh, 200,000 thousand horsemen. Uh, and the horses look evil. Some kind of warlike machine. Now this one, I believe, probably is not a creature, but it's John describing some kind of war machine that he saw from his first century AD 90 uh, understanding. And you know, horses were considered very important in battle and chariots were considered like tanks today, even bigger, better than tanks. 
Uh, it meant an army could move quickly and rapidly and safely and efficiently. So it sounds, it sounds to me like this could be some kind of a war machine that flies. I don't know. But still, okay, the sixth angel has sounded his trumpet, the second woe, and still humanity does not repent according to Revelation chapter 9. The third woe comes after the seventh trumpet is blown and also represents the seven bold judgments described in Revelation 16, 1 through 21. So, okay, we're in the first half of the tribulation. The six bold ju uh, trumpet judgments have been blown. Now, Revelation 10, another angel comes clothed with a cloud, a rainbow on his, on his head, a bright face as the sun, feet like fire. He has a little book in his hand. He sets his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the earth, which represents the sea, represents the world. The earth represents Israel. See how important Israel is? Sea is the world, earth is Israel. He lifts up his hand to heaven. He declares from the one who made all things that there shall be time no longer. Now, if we're in the tribulation, when did this happen? When the seventh angel sounds, the mysteries of God shall be finished or revealed. This is like the final warning, the final judgment on mankind. This will be the bold judgments, the third and final woe. He speaks, and it sounds like seven thunders, seven angels speaking at once. He tells John to seal up the things and do not write what they say. John is told to eat the book. It tastes sweet, but is bitter to his stomach. That's Revelation chapter 10, a prelude to the midpoint of the tribulation and the uh, uh, second half of the tribulation. Now, Revelation 11, uh, an angel tells John to measure the temple and the, and the altar of God. But he says, don't measure the court. That's the court of the Gentiles. Gentiles will tread down Jerusalem for three and a half years. That's the last three and a half years. This is Revelation 11. The two witnesses of God appear. Uh, this is the first half of the tribulation. They will destroy their enemies with fire, and men who hurt them will be killed. They have power to stop rain from falling, to cause water to turn to blood, and call, cause plagues upon the earth. The easiest way to understand the book of Revelation is to understand it chronologically and in order. And uh, it's... I'm not dogmatic on everything uh, like that, but I believe that's the easiest way to understand the book of Revelation. So here it talks about the two witnesses who appear, and that goes back. The reason we, I'll show you how we figure out that they started their ministry at the first part of tribulation, because this is the first mention of the two witnesses in Revelation 11, after we've already seen the trumpet judgments. But I'll tell you how we get to that. Okay, now we go to the middle of the seven-year period. That's the events of the first half of the tribulation. Now we go to the middle. There's events that happen at the middle, the midpoint of the tribulation, three and a half years. And then we go to the last part. First thing that happens at the midpoint of the tribulation of the seven-year period is the Antichrist breaks his covenant with Israel, causing her sacrifices to cease, Daniel 9, 27. And he shall confirm the covenant. Remember, he's confirming a covenant the Antichrist is that already exists. He confirms it. He doesn't create a covenant. Now it's possible he could create a brand new peace treaty, but I believe he's going to confirm the Abrahamic accords that we have now that nations continue to join. He's going to confirm the covenant with many for one week, seven year period. So the Antichrist started this covenant three and a half years prior to the midpoint. And in the midst of the week, three and a half years, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. Remember, first half of tribulation, uh, the temple is rebuilt and they are having sacrifices again, the Jewish people. And they are going to cease uh, and he's going to cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease for the overspreading of abominations. He shall make it desolate, an ab abomination of desolation, even unto the consummation, which is the end of all things when Jesus returns. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate it's all determined that it's going to happen at the midpoint of the tribulation. The Antichrist will desecrate the temple by going in and claiming he's God. The Antichrist will be revealed now in the, at, the, at the midpoint of the tribulation as the man of lawlessness. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, Let no man deceive you. By any means that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Now, falling away in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 means a departure. It's either the departure of the church from the rapture. You see, he's going to appear three and a half years before the midpoint. He's going to be on the scene, ruling the world, trying to gain control of the world, maybe even having control of the world from the ten kings. Remember, there's ten kings or ten horns, and uh, three will be defeated by this little horn, the Antichrist, and uh, he's going to be buddies 
with these ten kings, ten horns, horns means power, ten powerful elite or kings or world leaders. We're not sure. I'm leaning more and more to believe it's ten elites like the Bill Gates, the George Soros's, <clears throat> the, uh, <clears throat> the Pope, which I believe will probably be the false prophet, but if he's not, he'll be one of these, uh, Putin, some of these people who are up in years and who have gained control of the world. Uh, Nancy Pelosi is 80 years old. It seems to me uh, that the older you are, the better chance you have to be a world leader. If you can, like I said this morning in church, if you can stay out of the nursing home when you get past 80, you got a good chance of being a world leader. Look at all these guys. Uh, George Soros is 90-some. Uh, uh, Nancy Pelosi is 81. Uh, Klaus Schwab, who head of the World Economic Forum, is 84 years old. The Pope is 85 years old, almost 85 years old. Uh, seems like the older you are, the better chance you have of being a world uh, ruler or important as far as world events. And George Soros, I think I said him, he's in his 90s. And other men and women who are leaders today are much older than you'd even imagine that they are. Uh, so the Antichrist is revealed as a man of lawlessness. And 2 Thessalonians 8 and 9, 2 chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, and then the wick, that wicked, then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall come with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Now, the Antichrist doesn't get the power from Satan and the lying wonders until the midpoint of the tribulation. Before that, he is appointed and will be controlled by Satan, but at this point, he's not controlled yet by Satan. But he is going to appear on the scene and have a peace treaty with Israel. And he's going to uh, uh, guarantee their safety after the Gog Magog War. They will need someone to guarantee their safety because they've just been through a big battle and have been weakened. So he'll confirm their safety. They'll again fail to trust God who saved them from the Gog Magog invasion. And they'll fail to trust God again, another reason for their judgment in the tribulation. And the Antichrist, the beast, will come and sign a peace treaty with them. Then three and a half years later at the midpoint, he's going to be filled with the devil. Revelation 13, 5, and there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and power was given him to continue for 40 and two months. This is the last three and a half years of the tribulation. Revelation 13, 7, it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Revelation 17, 12, and 10 horns which thou sawest are 10 kings which have received no kingdom as yet. Now that's why I believe these 10 kings, 10 horns, no kingdom yet could be world elite leaders. They don't have a kingdom yet, but they're trying to wrestle the kingdom away from all good citizens of the world. The populist movement, that's why it's not popular. These 10 kings are, don't have a country. They want to rule uh, the world from their little domains, and they want borders to be done away with. They want a one-world government, and you see it right here in Revelation, 12, uh, Revelation 17, 12. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength to the beast. So these ten kings uh, will give their power to the beast and let him rule the world. They will consolidate under his power. Uh, this is events at the midpoint. And the Antichrist comes as a man and is killed and then goes into the pit and comes back to life from the pit energized by the power of the devil. Uh, the beast will kill the two witnesses. The bodies of the two witnesses will lie in the street for three and a half days and the people will rejoice and give each other gifts. After three and a half days, the two witnesses will come to life and be raptured into heaven. At the same time, an earthquake happens. Every time there's a resurrection of the dead into heaven, an earthquake appears. Jesus, the rapture, and the two witnesses. So the Antichrist comes, is killed, and energized by the... He goes into the pit and comes back energized and empowered by Satan. Okay, Vince in the midpoint of the tribulation, number four. In heaven, the temple of God appears with the ark of of God's presence, lightning, thunders, hail, voices, and great earthquakes occur. Okay, that's the end of the second woe. The second woe took part at the, at the midpoint of the tribulation. Now, the seventh angel sounds his trumpet. The great voices in heaven say, The kingdoms of, of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. The nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldst give reward to thy servants and the prophets and to the saints, and to them that fear thy name, small and great, should destroy them which destroy the earth. 
uh, the 24 elders fall down. The redeemed in heaven fell upon their faces and worshiped God. This is the redeemed in heaven. Uh, we talked about this way back in the first or second uh, outline study where the 24 elders were uh, leaders and Christ, not Christians, but faith leaders in the first part of, of the Old Testament. Uh, I think I saw a listing of 24 Old Testament patriarchs that would fit this uh, description of the 24 elders. Some say it's the church, uh, but I don't think it's the church yet. I think these 24 elders uh, could be uh, some type of patriarch or uh, people of faith that have passed on many years before Christ or even some of the apostles because by this time in AD 90, you see John's an apostle and he's not part of the 24 elders. So you got to think if it's the 12 and 24, why wasn't he on the scene uh, when the 24 elders back in uh, the seals, uh, I think it's Revelation chapters 4 and 5 where we're talking about when the elders first appear, Jesus has just been ascended into heaven. So anyway, not many people agree with that. Uh, well, a few, but uh, I read a, uh, the study Bible, uh, I can't remember the name of it. It had a listing of the 24 elders from Old Testament patriarchs, but I don't know. Anyway, they fall down, whoever they are, they're great men of God from the past, and they fall down at the midpoint of the tribulation. They're in heaven, and this scene shifts to heaven after the seventh angel sounds his trumpet. The second woe has ended. The third woe is getting ready to start. Uh, the temple of God is opened in heaven. The ark of his testament appears, and then comes the lightning, thundering voices, earthquake, and great hail. There's lots, there's like three or four times lightning, thunder, hail, and voices and great earthquakes occur in in uh, in the earth and in heaven. Okay, midpoint, there's war in heaven. Satan is forever cast down from heaven and energizes the Antichrist. Revelation chapter 12, and I'm not going to have time to read through all these scripture references. If we're going to finish tonight, we're already at 27 minutes. There's war in heaven and Satan is forever cast from down from heaven and energizes the Antichrist. Revelation 12, 12 through 17. There's a war in heaven between uh, the angels, the good angels and the bad angels. Uh, therefore, well, let me just read it. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. Uh, earth and sea, earth is Israel, sea is the world. For the devil has come down unto you, having, a great, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw uh, that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. You see, in the last half of the tribulation, Satan is going to be very angry at the man-child, the, the woman, the Israel who gave birth to Jesus Christ. And he's going to seek to destroy all of Israel so that Jesus Christ can't be uh, fulfill, fulfill the Davidic throne, the throne of David. The throne of David means he's going to rule over the people of God, the Jews. And if Satan can kill all the Jews, then he has made God's uh, uh, prophecies fail and that's his goal is to make the prophecies of God fail and if one prophecy fails then God is no longer God that's how God's word is so assured God is not even concerned that he can't keep all of his promises but the devil in his deluded mind thinks he can destroy God's people and he's going to give it a good shot and uh, Revelation 12, 14, And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished for a time, times and half a time, three and a half years. Uh, and, and from the face of the serpent, which is a description of the devil, he's after them, hot after them. So they run to Masada, uh, as Jesus tells us in Matthew 24, and the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away after the flood. This is a flood of wrath and evil things and evil uh, activities. It, it could be actual water. Uh, and the earth helped the woman and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed and keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Those that accepted Jesus Christ uh, in the 
first day of the tribulation that survived that onslaught because most of those Christians are already dead by the midpoint, but there's still more that will come to Christ because 144,000 are still preaching. So uh, he's going to make war with those saints and with uh, the remnant of her seed, the woman, which will be Israel. Jerusalem will be, Jerusalem will, will be overrun by Gentiles, Luke 21, 24. They shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled, Revelation 22. But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread down underfoot forty and two months. The last three and a half years, the Gentiles, you see, Israel is having sacrifices and operating in the first half of the tribulation. Remember, that's why the Gentiles are not in control yet, because Israel it seems to be have, operating normal, more than normal. They're actually going back to their religion, Jewish. Uh, they're having the sacrifices again of ritual animals and asking for forgiveness and worshiping God, but it's in error because they're looking for the Messiah. They're praying for the Messiah to come, but he's already come. And that's part of their punishment is their blindness. They, they thought they were doing right. You see, God saved them from the Gog Magog war. So their natural reaction is, let's worship God. Let's go back to the old ways. God has obviously saved us and the world will know it. So they'll start sacrificing, hope, thinking they're pleasing God, but they didn't turn to faith in Christ. That's the only way to please God is to have faith in Jesus Christ. So they turn to uh, temple sacrifices, and it's going to be stopped at the midpoint when Satan comes in, and, or the Antichrist comes into the temple and says, wait a minute, you don't need to sacrifice to the God in heaven, for I am God, stopping the sacrifices. So that's how the city then begins... The Gentiles begin pouring in, try to run the Jews out and destroy them under the power of Satan and the Antichrist. So the two witnesses at the midpoint, the two witnesses are slain by the Antichrist. This is how I know the two witnesses start their ministry at the first part of the tribulation uh, because they're killed, murdered at the midpoint. Revelation eleven seven, and when they have finished their testimony, they come to a point where their testimony is finished. The beast that ascendeth out of the bottoms of the pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. The guy who's the antichrist is struck stricken by a mortal wound and dies and he goes into the pit and he comes back filled with the spirit of satan and empowered to be the antichrist before that he's just the man of sin chosen to be the antichrist we'll know he's the antichrist if we were here because he signs a peace treaty with israel but that's why we won't be here we won't be here to tell everybody hey this is the antichrist don't mess with him we won't be here to tell people that. It's obvious from the scriptures we know who the Antichrist is. That's one of the reasons the church will not be here. One of many reasons. We'll be able to tell you who the Antichrist is and you can avoid him. But see, uh, he kills the two witnesses. He comes back from the pit empowered by Satan, the beast. The two witnesses are killed. It makes sense here so that the wrath of God can be poured out in the second half of the tribulation. The world has a Christmas party. It says uh, they overcome them and kill them. Remember there's that passage where they uh, give gifts to each other after the two witnesses are killed. That's how much the world hated these witnesses in the first half of the tribulation. See, things are going pretty good under, under the Antichrist, the beast. He's not, they don't know he's the Antichrist or the beast. They think he's just another, another world ruler. But at the midpoint, he is killed by a deadly wound and don't know who kills him or whatever, but he goes into the pit. He dies. His spirit is sent to the pit. His spirit comes back out, comes back into his body. He's resurrected. Uh, I don't know if he really died or not because Satan cannot, <coughs> he cannot resurrect the dead. Probably all fake, but there's something that's not fake that the, the, his spirit comes back from the pit energized by Satan because that's what the Bible says. So then the two witnesses midpoint the tribulation still, a lot going on. The two witnesses are resurrected, Revelation 11, 11, and 12. After three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet and great fear upon, fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. You see, it makes sense here, the midpoint, because they'll be making a U-turn at the end of the tribulation. We know they're going to testify for 40 and 2 months. And then after that, 40 and 2 months, the Gentiles are going to tread down Israel. They won't have the two witnesses to worry about. They're going to be resurrected taken to heaven at the midpoint of the tribulation. Now, dogmatic about all this? No. 
90% sure, that's about all any prophecy teacher can tell you. But I believe uh, that if you just read the Bible and the book of Revelation in chronological order, it makes it much easier to understand. Midpoint, the Antichrist is wounded and miraculously comes back to life. We've mentioned this, uh, Revelation 13, 3, and I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. See, he's going to make a trip down to hell. His spirit, he's going to be seemingly resurrected, but Satan cannot raise anyone from the dead. It's a trick to make people believe that the Antichrist was killed and came back to life, to further cause people to think he is the Antichrist. He is Jesus Christ, possibly Jesus warned us in Matthew 24, many shall come in my name saying I am Christ. And, uh, but there's one man of sin that really will act like Christ more than any others. And then at the midpoint of the tribulation, there's going to be martyrs, of course, in the first half of the tribulation. Just about everyone accepts the gospel of Christ and the coming kingdom will be martyred in the first half of the tribulation. Many will be saved in the second half, but not nearly as many as the first half. Great revival, greatest revival in world history will come about when those 144,000 witnesses, the two witnesses who were slain and rose again, and the angel, there's an angel going around preaching the everlasting gospel, uh, greatest revival in history will occur due to the preaching of those people. And what a day it's going to be. Uh, uh, Daniel chapter 7, 21 seems to allude to the fact that the Antichrist will kill many of the saints of God. Uh, Daniel 7, 21, I beheld in the same horn made war with the saints. That's the little horn, as he's called in the book of Daniel, and prevailed against them. And I beheld the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. Daniel 7, 25, and he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change the times and laws and they shall be given to his hand to a time, times and dividing of time. He'll do this for three and a half years. And this will continue even into the second half of the tribulation which, with Jewish believers and some Gentile believers who convert in the second half of the tribulation. Now, uh, Daniel 7, 25 may be referring to the second half of the tribulation and the purge of Jews because it says he shall speak great words against the Most High, which means at this point he's already gone to the temple and declared himself to be God and going to wear out the saints of the Most High and uh, he's going to change the time and the laws. He's going to change Jewish law and ceremony, which they've been practicing uh, in the first half of the tribulation. Uh, so this actually, Daniel 7.25, it refers, I believe, to the second half of the tribulation. And then Revelation 13 tells about making war with the saints to overcome them. Uh, Revelation 7 uh, talks about uh, all the... Now, remember, Revelation... The seven is a uh, prelude of the end of the tribulation where it talks about all the saints stood before the throne and before the lamb clothed in white robes. This is a uh, not the prelude of the tribulation. or It's the first half of the tribulation where all the saints are murdered and martyred. And you see in Revelation 7, 9 through 14, it talks about a great multitude which no man could number of all nations, kindreds, and people, and tongues stood before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Revelation chapter 6 talks about a uh, group of martyrs saying, How long, O Lord? I believe that is the martyrs down through history, all of history, including up to the tribulation. And then in Revelation chapter 7, these are tribulation saints because it says uh, in verse... Uh, 13, Revelation 7, 13, and that one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, unto him Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of the great tribulation, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Uh, so they come out of the great tribulation, which is uh, the tribulation period. And uh, that's the first part, the first half, of the tribulation and the middle point of the tribulation. And we're 40 minutes into this. I'll go a little bit longer. I'm not going to be able to finish tonight. <laughs> I've got like a 60 page uh, teaching and a 60 page article written on these outline of end time events. And I'm about uh, on page. 31. So we're not going to finish tonight. 
The events now of the second half of the seven-year period, I tell you what, I may wait till next week to do the events of the second half of the seven-year period. But I want to tell you this. You can find this entire outline updated just this week on tomahawkmbc.com. And you click that little thing in the a corner. Let's see. Yeah, it's in the right corner. Where is that? I'm trying to get my finger over there. You'll see it on the web page. And it has a little thing. You click on that. It goes down and gives you a list of uh, subtitles. And you click on Outline of End Time Events. And the whole article that I'm teaching from right now is on that web page. You can read it at your convenience. You can print it out. Go to your home computer and print that out. And you'll have exactly what I have and what I've written and researched over the years. So if you want to continue study on this, I urge you to print that out or just go to the web page and uh, bookmark it, whatever, and, uh, and you'll find out. You'll see exactly what I'm going over. And you can fill in the gaps. Read this again, whatever you want to do. It's not hard reading. It really helps you understand what's going to happen in the end time. So you'll not have fear, but you'll have understanding. And you'll not have fear of the book of Revelation. I'm writing, I'm working on a, an entire outline on the book of Revelation, but I don't know when I'm going to be able to get that finished. It probably won't be till after spring or sometime this spring. But this actually works just as well, if not better, because it takes in all uh, prophetic references from all the Bible about the end time events. If you want a synapsis of what's going to happen in the end times, now some disagree, uh, but they can't disagree with the fact these are all the passages you'll find about the end times. Uh, now, I haven't been exhaustive, like uh, there's Matthew 24, Luke 21, uh, Mark 13, uh, and uh, they talk about in the Olivet Discourse of Jesus when he was talking about when will these things be, the end of time, and what's going to happen. Uh, it's not got all of those verses, or Matthew 25, and uh, I think uh, Luke 17 has some end time uh, Olivet Discourse things Jesus talked about. Those aren't in there, but uh, they're alluded to. And if you get Matthew 24 and Luke 21, some I got mostly passages from those two in Luke 17, what I'm saying is you're going to get most of the passages that outline the Bible in this outline of end time events. Now, it's, uh, I updated it last week because I thought it didn't flow very well, so I updated it. And I learn things as I go. I've learned quite a bit in the last uh, couple of months by studying the book of Revelation again and again and again and uh, reading what other people think. And we should study trusted and reliable people, even people you don't trust and rely on. See what they think. It takes a lot of study and work to uh, understand uh, what's going on in the book uh, in end time events. If you are prone to, uh, it's not hard to understand the Bible, and it's not hard to understand the book of Revelation because the Bible promises two blessings if you uh, read the book of Revelation. Read it and read it and read it. Uh, I try to read it, like I said, at least once or twice a month. And then I've got this outline of end time events that ties all the scriptures together. That's the thing I want is people to realize it's not a scary thing. It's a thing of the end time is a time of hope and joy and peace and rejoicing. And it's a time of woe for the world. We talked about three woes. And uh, the third woe will be the opening of the vile judgments in the second half of the tribulation. So uh, I think it's all lined out pretty good. There's some mistakes, yes. I find a few, like this reference in 725, that probably should have gone uh, with the first half of the tribulation where the saints are. Well, the, uh, I got it here in the midpoint where the saints are killed, but I guess that's where it should go because by the end of the midpoint, they're all killed. The Christians are killed. But the book of Revelation, I believe with my whole heart, is in chronological order. And if we take it that way, Matthew 24 is in chronological order. And we'll do a study on Matthew 24 sometime because I have an outline on Matthew 24 
Luke 21, Mark 13, uh, Luke 17. I've got an outline on that that I need to bring to you because it is in chronological order. So, if it's in chronological order, then uh, it's easier to understand. And it does jump from heavenly scenes to earthly scenes <clears throat> in a three or four occasions, maybe more than that. But you know, again, people who say that there's the tribulation has already begun have to understand that uh, I just read all of those events in the first half, one third this, one third that, one third that, one third that. And uh, angels, 31 angels mentioned in the book of Revelation that appear. 31 different angels appear in the book of Revelation. Now, whether they're actually different ones, I don't know. Uh, but 31, that's another study we could have. The 31 angels of Revelation. You know, there's 30, Baskin Robbins has 31 flavors. <laughs> there's 31 angels. Now, this is according to one guy, uh, a book. He has out called The 31 Angels of Revelation. I guess I could read his book <laughs> and get the study for you. Or I could tell you who the book, who authored the book. But I heard him speak about it. It's very interesting. Very fascinating, actually, to borrow a phrase from Spock. Very fascinating. Fascinating. And it is. The study of the Bible is fascinating. And that's what I'm trying to get you to do. I'm not trying to make it complicated. I know I talk fast and go through a lot of material. But you go to... Tomahawk M, as in missionary, B.C., Baptist Church, TomahawkMBC.com, and go to the outline of end time events, and you have all that I have right there before you. And just go through it, and uh, you'll find that it's, it makes sense, it's in perfect order, and it, it helps you understand exactly what's going on. And I don't expect you to memorize it or remember it so go through it uh two or three times a month just to keep yourself familiar because we are in the end times outline of end time events we're there we were there starting in 1948 so everyone listening to my voice since the day you were born you were in the last of the last days you were born for a time such as this uh just like Esther, she was born for a time such as this. And it's exciting to be a part of Bible prophecy. We are a part of it. You imagine when Jesus comes on those white horses, you will be with him. The rapture of the church will include you if you haven't died. And we are chosen for such a time as this. I don't know why he chose me. But he did to be boring during this time, born during this time, to be boring during this time. <laughs> but we are so grateful and thankful just that he gave us life, that we can serve him with it. J Adrian Rogers, the great preacher from Bellevue Baptist Church, you've heard of him, been on TV and radio. He passed away in 2005, I believe, of cancer at the age of 73. He's the greatest preacher I've ever heard. And I've heard some great ones, even locally, uh, I've heard some great preachers. And uh, there are some great preachers today. But Adrian Rogers, to me, is the prince of preachers. And uh, he's still, you can still catch his sermons. But uh, as a 19-year-old boy, he decided to give his life to the Lord and go to Bible college and be a preacher. And one of the wealthy men of the town met him on the steps of the Baptist Church as Adrian was leaving after announcing his call. And the guy said, Adrian, you're brilliant. Don't waste your life on this ministry for Jesus. I, I mean, I know you mean well, but you can do so much more. Adrian Rogers, at 19 years old, turned to this preacher, or to this man, businessman, wealthy businessman, and says, Sir, I don't mean to offend you, but I wish I had a thousand lives to waste for Jesus. I wish I had a thousand lives to waste for Jesus. <laughs> Thing is, we only get one. And let's waste it for Jesus and give him glory and honor and praise. And you know, you're not wasting your life. You're investing your life in the greatest work in the history of mankind. 
the greatest work, the most glorious work. We're working for the glory of God and his son, Jesus Christ, whom he sent to save the world. Now, times are going to get uh, difficult, but my goodness, it's a time of joy. Jesus is coming probably in our lifetime. He's coming. We rejoice. I read these things for you from the Bible, these events, because out of excitement, and excitement that I'm finally beginning to understand Bible prophecy uh, and put it all together. You know, I've been at this for 50 years and uh, I've heard it all, heard every teaching, believed some of it. I mean, I've been wrong and nobody can say they're 100% right. There's a lot of arrogant people that tell you this is the way it is and that's the only way. I just let the Bible prove itself. And the best way to do that is to take the Bible as it says and in order. If you want to understand prophecy, prophecy is uh, always done in order. God does everything in order. It doesn't say that it might give a prophecy. Uh, well, prophecy is telling things ahead of time. But forth telling is uh, uh, preaching the Bible today foretelling is telling the future and prophets foretold and foretold now uh, these prophets of god foretold the future of events that would happen in order and uh, <clears throat> i'm not saying that the book of daniel jumps around a little bit yes it does uh, but you can get an orderly picture Jan daniel jumps from uh, near future like the uh, Antiochus Epiphanes in uh, the second century. Daniel is in the uh, fourth or fifth century. He's in the fifth century, five uh, fifty something BC. He's in the captivity, Babylon captivity. So he's around five eighty seven to five uh, twenty seven, five ninety seven to five twenty seven BC. Somewhere in there, it gets probably later, probably like five forty seven, five thirty seven BC. And he's prophesying events that are going to happen in the near future. Uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, and he prophesies about uh, some nations that will rise to power during that time and fall. He, preaches, he prophesies about Rome. But he also gives long-term prophecies about uh, the 70 weeks of Israel. And he gives prophecies about the Antichrist and the ten horns. I mean, he talks about the ten kings, the ten the Revelation calls them ten kings. He calls them ten horns. Horns means power. So, uh, still, all in all, Daniel is pretty much in chronological order uh, as far as when it starts biblical prophecy. Biblical prophecy in Daniel starts in chapter 7, goes through chapter 12. You got a little bit there in Daniel 4 and 5. And, but really, all of the book of Daniel is prophecy, even uh, the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you know, the, the idol they're told to worship, is that a, s a symbol for the Antichrist? And that, remember in the New Testament, in the book of Revelation, during the tribulation, the Antichrist's image is going to be worshipped. People are going to have a chance again to stand like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So the book of Daniel has some great Bible stories. Daniel in the lion's den, uh, the fiery furnace, Handwriting on the wall, all those great stories are all really Bible prophecy that we'll get into. That'd be another good study, the book of Daniel. But anyway, and not many people teach the book of Daniel, and it's a great study of Bible prophecy and some great stories that everyone can relate to, and such touching stories of faith in the book of Daniel, some of the greatest Bible stories ever. That's why I love the book of Daniel. Okay. I'm going to close for tonight, and we will catch you, looks like, probably uh, as we begin church service on the 14th. Uh, we're going to be at Tomahawk Missionary Baptist. My goal is, is we hope we get sudden link so that I can do these Facebook Live. If not, I will uh, record them and put them on Facebook. I always record my messages from the church. It won't be Facebook Live. I'm going to try if we, if we can. If you don't see me next Sunday night, that means we've failed. But I will have the message recorded. I will be continuing Outline of End Time Events. This will be part seven coming up. We just finished tonight, part six. I will continue that because I want to con conclude this study. And uh, I think it's very important for us. 
So with that, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your blessings. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this study. Thank you, Lord, how you work everything for our good and your glory. And Lord, may your name be glorified. May Jesus be lifted up in this world. And Lord, help us to follow you as far as you take us, Lord. And we just pray that you'll bless this group that's listened. Bless all that'll hear this broadcast. And Lord, we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much and uh, good night.